Welcome to our third regional webinar for the Safeguarding Hub Eastern Europe. My name is Sarah Martin, and I'm the Regional Capacity Building Advisor for the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub for Eastern Europe. Um, I, we did want to tell you that today's webinar contains material that might be difficult to uh, listen to or to discuss. Our second presenter, Martina Brostrom, will speak about sexual violence that she experienced. Some of you may find this distressing. For those of you who are new to the Safeguarding Resources and Support Hub, let me give you a brief inter overview and invite you to check out our website. The Safeguarding Hub Eastern Europe is a resource for organizations and individuals responding to the war on Ukraine, and we provide practical and accessible safeguarding resources, and we aim to reduce harm for refugees and displaced people. Some of you we know are joining from outside the region, and we'd like to let you know that we have a global hub with many, many resources to help you in your safeguarding journey, and that we also have regional hubs in the Middle East, in Asia, and in different countries in Africa, including Nigeria and Ethiopia, and you can find materials in a variety of languages. So please feel free to check out our website and get information there. Here in Eastern Europe, over the past 14 months, people across the region have mobilized to welcome and to offer hospitality to refugees and displaced people who fled the war on Ukraine. Many organizations, both big and small, are involved in the humanitarian response. But unfortunately, in the humanitarian community, we also know that in times of crisis, there can be harm that is committed by humanitarians. This harm can include sexual exploitation and abuse, discrimination, or harassment. At the Safeguarding Hub Eastern Europe, we use the term safeguarding, which means preventing, hub to, uh, preventing harm to people and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. You may also be used to hearing the terms PSEA, protection from sexual exploitation and abuse, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, but we're, we uh, use the term safeguarding. Administrative investigations of allegations of sexual exploitation and abuse and other abuses is a common tool in the safeguarding response. The United Nations and international NGOs use common principles and standards to conduct administrative investigations of SEA and other safeguarding concerns. So we've invited safeguarding and SEA investigation specialist, Lucy Heaven Taylor, to discuss the steps of safeguarding investigations. She's also the author of our How To Note on Survivor-Centered Safeguarding Investigations and the co-author, along with Martina Brostrom, our second presenter, of the CHS Alliance's foundational paper on victim and survivor-centered approach to protection from sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment in the aid sector. So this presentation will provide an easy to understand explanation of what the steps are required for administrative investigations, including understanding the evidence threshold balance of probability. And it'll also help you better understand what happens when the investigation is over. We're going to explain basic concepts and terms, um, and including the principle of fairness and the right to procedural fairness, also known as due process rights. You're encouraged to ask questions that you have um, so that you can demystify this process. We want this to be a place where you feel safe to ask the questions that you have so that we can all come out of the um, webinar with a better understanding of what we need to have in place when we're doing investigations. So after Martina and Lucy have presented, um, we will begin to take questions from the audience. So again, put your questions in the Q&A box because the chat, there's a lot of you today. So the chat, um, uh, it'll be difficult to catch them in the chat. Please put them in the Q&A box. You can also get more information about investigations on a specific page on our website, and we'll put the link in the chat after that. So our first speaker today is Lucy Heaven Taylor. Lucy's a senior consultant with over 20 years experience of working on safeguarding and protection from sexual exploitation, abuse, and sexual harassment in the humanitarian and development sector. She began her career in the conflicts in Bosnia and Kosovo, and she's been working with us here at the Safeguarding Hub and is the author of our how-to guide, as I mentioned. Our second speaker is Martina Brostrom of CHS Alliance. Martina is a passionate advocate for equal rights, and she has courageously shed light on sexual abuse, sexism, and gender inequality prevailing in the UN system. We're very lucky to have her here to share her story with us today. Her fight has inspired reforms towards more victim and survivor-centered, trauma-informed approaches to working on SEAH and greater institutional accountability. You can read more, um, including their full bios on our website. 
Um, again, uh, for the Q&A, we have the capacity to answer your questions in English and Hungarian, but it will be difficult for us to answer questions in Czech or Ukrainian. We apologize, but you can always uh, write to us at our help desk, and I'll give you more information about that at the end of the webinar. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Lucy. Thank you very much, Sarah, and welcome again to everyone attending this webinar this morning. So let's get right to it. Um, the reason why we're here today to talk about what do we mean by a safeguarding or PSEA investigation. So in our sector, a PSEA investigation is a workplace administrative investigation. It takes place when further information is required to determine whether a staff member or volunteer or anyone working on behalf of our NGO or CSO has breached our organisational PSEA policy or our code of conduct. What a safeguarding PSEA investigation isn't, it's not a police or a law enforcement investigation. It's like any other investigation that we might undertake in our workplace into staff misconduct. Next slide, please, Emmy. So Sarah's already mentioned some of the terminology that we use, but I'd like to unpack that just a little bit more because we are as a sector, we're prone to using jargon and acronyms. You'll hear myself uh, and possibly Martina using them as well. So just to explain what some of them are and also to say that you don't necessarily need to use this terminology in your work. And we recommend that whatever terms in your language work for you should be used. But for the purposes of this webinar, as Sarah's already touched on, by safeguarding, we mean preventing harm that is caused by our staff or our volunteers or our program design and implementation. And this harm can be a range from physical, emotional or sexual harassment, exploitation or abuse. PSEA, Protection from Sexual Exploitation and Abuse, is a subset of safeguarding and it specifically focuses on protecting people from sexual exploitation and abuse caused by our staff and volunteers. We use the terms victim and survivor. Um, a survivor is the person who is or has been sexually exploited or otherwise abused. You might hear some of us using the term victim, some survivor, some victim survivor, um, both terms have reasons for their use, but the most important thing is that the person who has experienced the sexual exploitation and abuse chooses the terms that they're comfortable with to describe their experience. We also use the term survivor-centred, so I'm going to unpack that a little bit more in this webinar. Survivor-centred means that the survivor's wishes, safety and well-being remain a priority in all matters and procedures. As I say, we'll take a little bit more of a closer look about what that means in this presentation. So next slide, please. So when do we undertake a PSEA investigation? So there's a certain set of circumstances under which we take an investigation, uh, possibly not as often as we think, because we know that the investigation has become a buzzword in our sector recently. We're hearing a, a lot from donors but there's only a specific reason why we might undertake a PSEA investigation. So we need to first ask ourselves, was this safeguarding or PSEA issue or incident that we've become aware of, was it possible that it was perpetrated by our own staff or volunteers or somebody working on behalf of our organization? If the answer is no, and it was perpetrated by somebody in the wider community, then it needs to be referred to the relevant authorities. If, however, we think that this PSEA incident might have been perpetrated by someone working on our behalf, we next need to ask, does this incident potentially represent a breach of the law? Remember, we're talking about workplace administrative investigations here into breach of our policy. If we think that the law might have been broken, if it is safe to do so, then we simply just refer it to law enforcement. However, if it's a breach of our policy that's not necessarily a breach of the law, then we need to think about, do we need more information to find out what happened? If there's enough information already that means that we can move straight to disciplinary hearings, then we can go ahead and do that. 
However, the purpose of an investigation is to gather more information that we might need to make a conclusion. So if we do need further information, that is when an investigation might be required. Next slide, please. So I've said that um, a sexual exploitation and abuse investigation, it's, uh, it's a workplace investigation into misconduct, like others that we might undertake. However, there are specific considerations that we need to think about when it's a workplace investigation into sexual exploitation or abuse. We need to consider that there's a risk of re-traumatization with the survivor and possibly other witnesses. Sexual exploitation and abuse is, of course, it's a traumatic and sensitive issue and we need to handle it accordingly. We need to be aware that there may be potential safety and security risks to the survivor and others involved in the case. Now, we know that sexual exploitation and abuse is an abuse of power, so it stands to reason that our perpetrator needs to be in a position of power in, or, in order to abuse or exploit others. And if they are in a position of power, this might give them the means to threaten or coerce the survivor and other people involved in the investigation. So we need to be aware of that. Now, we've spoken about the fact that a PSEA investigation is when it's our staff member or volunteer or someone we're responsible for who's perpetrating. Now, they might be sexually exploiting, exploiting or abusing someone in the wider community, in the beneficiary community or displaced people that we're working with. They also might be sexually harassing or exploiting another member of staff. Now with sexual harassment in the workplace, there can be different policies and legal obligations that apply because in this case, we're not only accountable for the actions of our staff member, uh, but we're also accountable for the safety and protection of our member of staff who might be being harassed or abused. So it's worth checking with your organisation what your workplace policies say about workplace sexual harassment and whether that's different from how you would deal with it if it's sexual exploitation and abuse of somebody in the wider community. Next slide, please. So what actually happens within a sexual exploitation and abuse investigation? Well, it's no mystery. Um, it's a series of steps. It might not always be exactly as it's portrayed here on the slide, but this is more or less what tends to happen when an SEA investigation takes place. Now, the first step is that we always offer support to the survivor. This is in advance of making any decisions based on the investigation. So we don't know actually whether SEA was perpetrated. It was the responsibility of our organisation. But nonetheless, we go ahead and offer support to the survivor. And by that, we mean uh, psychosocial support, legal support, medical support that they might need. And we support them to access that. We always do this with the consent of the survivor. The exception is when we are dealing with cases that involve children under the age of 18. In that case, uh, we don't look at consent, but rather we look at acting in the best interests of the child. So we will always refer them to services when it's safe to do so. Then we go about assigning roles and responsibilities. Now, the important thing with investigation is that there's a separation of duties. So the person who makes the final decision and commissions the investigation is known as the investigation manager, is separate from the team that undertakes the investigation. This is because so that there is transparency and it's not just one person or set of people who is making all the decisions about the investigation. Then a terms of reference is developed for the team. And then the investigation team look at what available information there is already about what may have happened. So for example, um, there might be things like WhatsApp messages, other information that relates to the investigation. And that they then develop a plan of how they're going to undertake the investigation. Part of the investigation usually involves interviewing witnesses, the survivor, if they've consented and agreed to do so, um, possibly other people who might be related with the investigation might have information to share. It's important, of course, that interviews are undertaken by people who have experience of conducting SEA investigations. Then, the information is collected and analysed to see whether the information 
either upholds or does not uphold the allegation. And that's those recommendations and conclusions are then shared with the investigation manager. So the investigation manager takes a look through the report, um, checks that all the information shared uh, does support the conclusions that have been reached. And if they do, then they will make a decision on next steps based on those conclusions. Next slide, please. So that's what happens in an investigation. Um, what about a survivor-centred investigation? Now, for this slide, um, taking the work that um, Martina Brostrom has been leading for CHS Alliance uh, into looking at how we can make responses to SEA survivor-centred. And in that report, uh, there are a number of recommendations about all of the steps that we take when we're responding to SEA. And this is a summary of the recommendations that are proposed for dealing with an investigation and how to make it survivor-centred. First of all, everything we do acknowledges that survivors are the experts in their own situation and that they know what's best for them. Your NGO or CSO should consider even whether an investigation is necessary because there is the risk of it re-traumatising people involved. Or are there other options or steps that we can take in order to resolve this situation? Investigations should proceed with the informed consent from the survivor. The survivor might uh, consent for the investigation to take place and for them to participate in it, or they might consent for the investigation to go ahead without their involvement, which is also possible. If they do not consent for an investigation to take place, then a decision will need to be made by senior management about the next steps. We recommend that survivors are accompanied by a support person throughout the process, if that's what they wish. We recommend that investigations, of course, must follow sector standards and must not cause further trauma to anyone involved and should use trained and experienced investigators. We also recommend that investigations use balance of probability as an evidentiary threshold to make decisions. And we'll take a look in the next slide, please, about what we mean by balance of probability. So as I say, balance of probability is a threshold of evidence in undertaking an investigation. In a workplace investigation, this is the threshold that we usually use, and it means that something is more likely to have happened than not. Now, you may have heard or be familiar with the legal threshold beyond reasonable doubt. We recommend that this is not used in a workplace administrative investigation. It's very hard to prove in cases of sexual exploitation and abuse. And actually, we don't consider it necessary because workplace investigations, as I say, use balance of probability, usually in terms of due process. Next slide, please. So what happens after the investigation? Well, as I've said, a decision is made what to do next based on the investigation conclusions, and that's made by the investigation manager. If the allegation is upheld, then the next steps are usually that it would go to a disciplinary hearing according to the policies of your organisation. If the allegation is not upheld, then that staff member or volunteer uh, is cleared in this instance, meaning that it will not be held on their records that there was an investigation against them. However, it's usual practice that we keep a record of the investigation somewhere in case there are future similar incidents that arise in the future. Support to the survivor, of course, continues when and for as long as they want it. Survivors don't always want to access support immediately. They want, might want to support to access it on and off, and it might be a long term process. So we as organisations should commit to survive, to providing that support for as long as they need it. And then finally, an area that we tend to be weak on as a sector, but is quite often the most important thing to the survivor, which is justice for the survivor. And justice can look like uh, many things for the survivor in terms of uh, compensation, acknowledgement of harm, and so on. And Martina will talk a little bit more about that, I think, when she shared, shares her experience. Um, but more work needs to be done in our sector to work out what this will actually look like. Next slide, please. Uh, now, I think Sarah was going to share further information with you about that, but um, 
that was very much an introduction to investigations, um, probably lots of questions, lots of further need for support and so on, but help is available from the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub. As Sarah mentioned, there's a how-to note um, upon which this webinar has been based, which goes into a little bit more detail about what happens in an investigation. There's also the help desk with support available in English, Romanian and Russian presently. And the website itself is available in English, Ukrainian, Polish, Romanian and Russian. As I say, I think Sarah will share more information about that. Uh, but we are here to help um, you demystify investigations. So I think that's it from me for the moment. Um, I, we will be available for questions at the end, but I think I'm going to hand over to Sarah now to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, you're on mute, Sarah. Um, I noticed people are putting questions in the Q&A, so please continue to do so. We're gathering them together for the uh, for Martina and Lucy when they finish speaking. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Martina Brostrom from the CHS Alliance. Um, over to you, Martina. Thanks, Sarah, and hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Martina, and I'm working for the CHS Alliance as a project manager, and I'm here really today speaking about my own personal experience when it comes to uh, SEAH investigations. Martina, and would you like to turn your camera on? There you go. Thank you. Hello. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, Lucy highlighted the importance of taking a victim-centered approach to investigations, and it's something that I've learned firsthand is very, very essential. I've also learned firsthand what happens when investigations are poorly done and what the, the implications are for the individual survivors, but also for the organization to have to mop up all the aftermath um, of a poorly done investigation. And so my story really goes back to 2015 when I was sexually assaulted on the sidelines of a work event in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, it was the perpetrator was uh, the number two of the UN organization UNAIDS that I worked for. And he was a close friend and ally of the executive director. He was also my second line supervisor. And so a, quite a powerful man in the organization where I worked. Um, I had worked for about 10 years at the time when this happened in the organization. So I considered I had worked both in the field office and in headquarters. And I considered myself somebody who had a lot of friends and colleagues in the organization and um, respect and so on. Um, and I'm... I'm telling you that because even knowing that I uh, that the, that at the time I I had people that I trusted and I knew the rules very well and I thought that uh, and I wasn't new where I wasn't on the fringes of having a job um, I'd been there for quite a while and still my experiences was very very challenging. Um, initially, when it happened, I was very hesitant to report it, but I did disclose to um, my mother a very trusted friend and also my direct supervisor, but I swore them to silence and to not share this with anybody. And that was my way of figuring out the disclosure was immediate, like out of the trauma that had happened the very same day there and then running frantically. And then I, I was not ready to really go from there to be dealing with what felt like a very administrative situation. I was the breadwinner of my family at the time, and I needed to really sort of land in what had happened to me and, and then make some decisions. Um, I think another factor was that I had worked in the organization very long, so I knew the work culture, and I also knew how uh, this particular man was somebody that we all knew, all us women working in the organization, was somebody who was flirtatious, I would say inappropriate in his behavior for workplace, but the organizational culture had evolved such that people just turned a blind eye to his behavior and us women kind of just um, warned new recruits to stay away from one another. Um, 
I also read and reread the sexual harassment policy at the time, and it required that I had to go through a process of informal resolution, which is quite awkward, but it basically entailed for me speaking to the ombudsman, the staff association, the uh, chief of staff, the executive director, and they were all men at the time, and they all had the same message for me, which was, you know, try to forget about this, don't ruin your career over this, and nobody ever offered support um, or to, to even address what had happened to me. But because at the same time as this was happening, and I should mention as well that actually very early on or immediately upon um, following my disclosure, but before reporting it internally, I had actually told somebody in my own government, which was the government of Sweden, and it was because I could feel straight away how the in my work environment started changing and it didn't take long before the retaliation happened to me and that was blocking my work blocking my uh, presence in meeting moving work areas. I had become a liability to the perpetrator and he was powerful enough to try to confine my job remember he was my second line supervisor. So informal resolution didn't work for me and the retaliation didn't stop. And actually, every time I started speaking to people about what had happened to me and having just been told that it doesn't matter, can't do anything for you, try to forget about it. I have to say that my hurt and my trauma also started transforming into a lot of frustration. Uh, I was kind of driven at this point by a uh, this need to tell other women and warn other women about what was going on and a sense of rage about that nobody that everybody was just accepting it and I was processing my trauma at the same time so I launched a formal written complaint and that's what uh, would have normally triggered the investigation process in my case though I was told that I was beyond the statute of limitation what does that mean? It means that I had waited more than 120 days to make a formal complaint. And that felt absurd to me, given that I had went through one year of full informal resolution. Um, so I had to then go and lobby the uh, investigation director, who was actually based in the World Health Organization at the time, and uh, tried to convince him to convince the executive director that this had to be investigated. Um, and uh, I also was informed during my meetings with the investigator that standard practice is that you actually make a request for administrative leave for the perpetrator to protect the integrity of the investigation and to protect me, who had launched a complaint against um, the deputy executive director. Uh, but when I made my request to the human resources, they said that we should not, they, they, they re rejected my request uh, on the basis that they did not see any reasons for why he couldn't be there. Um, and of course, uh, it did impact the course of the investigation. The investigation lasted 14 months. Um, and during this time, because the perpetrator was in his still position, he was able to restructure the organization. He was also able to uh, use uh, victims uh, and uh, sorry, other witnesses and their testimonies to place them under his supervision. Uh, and in that way, he was able to influence the course of the investigations and many of the witnesses uh, were uh, could not remember what had happened or they were um, uh, they were too afraid to actually share the truth of what they had witnessed and on the other hand people that did come forward as witnesses during course of this investigations that testified in my favor or what they had seen and observed they basically had to they they were forced out of the organization either being mobile or first early retirement or themselves accused of various types of misconduct and um, the investigation itself was in form of skype interviews uh, i did ask for a female investigator i think that that was important they took place during over christmas so I was in the comfort of my own home. I think that was important. But it was clear that the investigator, uh, while she tried to do her best, it was a poorly executed exercise. And how do I know that? I know that because when you're feeling very emotional, speaking about a sexual assault that has happened in a confined space, and the person says, 
Yes, yes, I understand. Now, can I ask you what you were wearing uh, in those kind of, and what did you do to fend him off? When you start hearing questions like that, it's kind of difficult to process. Um, all the time during these 14 months when the initial investigation happened, I was subject to pressures inside of the organization. Um, I was trying to be silenced. Um, I have, was my friends and colleagues did no longer want to sit with me in the cafeteria because they were called into his uh, assistance office and being told to be careful with whom they sit in the cafeteria and uh, and that they should think about who holds their career in their hands. So I started to feel very, very lonely during this period of time and and very few friends would kind of send me private messages on Facebook in solidarity and support. But during at my workplace, I was very, very much alone. Uh, and I think there was also a difference in the power balance between me and this uh, uh, perpetrator who was a deputy executive director because he would spend his private time you know, being friends in the senior management group, they would go to each other's houses, they would speak over personal emails, they would use personal phones to discuss this quite HR related matter. So that's absolutely not allowed, but that absolutely happened. And with my own regards, I was, it was just formal interactions with email clearly scripted. So little by little, the perpetrator and the organization started sort of uh, having the same narrative and the purpose and I was on the other side and I think that's something that people might not think about how the role of victim really changes um, the investigation itself is very much uh, he says something you say something and then you're supposed to have the investigator uh, um, sort of judging that according to the balance of probabilities as Lucy mentioned but what often happens is that the uh, the perpetrator is having inside information through his uh, through the organization so they kind of become complicit against you and the mere fact that you've launched an investigation is unpleasant for the organization because it's suggesting that something happened that shouldn't have had happened and that they have somehow breached in their duty of care for you so while initially you get sympathy uh, very little though about what you've went through people can accept you as a victim like that but the moment you actually launch an investigation you now uh, are kind of launching it against the organization and and you start feeling that shift in in power and uh, respect and sympathy uh, as the victim um i didn't have any feedback for the 14 months that the investigation happened and then suddenly i learned through a press release on the organizational website i'm sitting at my desk in the office where we're both working and I'm refreshing my email and suddenly I have an email saying that uh, through press release uh, and the press release is stating that uh, the one case uh, of sexual harassment that they called it had uh, had been completed and that uh, that it had concluded that the perpetrator was innocent uh, and of course as Lucy would say the only other thing that an SCH investigation can test tell you is whether it is substantiated or not substantiated. But using words like innocent and trying to put a, a sort of um, a spin on that and to not provide any information for 14 months and then you learn something like this, which is very difficult to process because you know that this has happened, is extremely was extremely difficult for me. Uh, but and and of course, at the same time as that investigation had stopped, then the tone started shifting towards me. So it was like I have now been recast from the victim to being the person that has somehow nobody told me that I'd made up the allegations. But because the allegations had said that he was innocent, they it was like what had happened to me was very minimal. And all of a sudden they started scrutinizing my PTSD, sick leave, medical certificates, my absences, et cetera. So there was a whole institutional thing that happened. And I think that's um, that's really difficult for the survivor as well, because of course you're dealing with the trauma and then you're dealing with the investigation and then you're trying to be performant and play the role of partner or mother or uh, work colleague and to bring all of that together with this kind of heavy weight of the system on top of you isn't always easy. Um, but luckily the investigation did not end there um, because as the um, 
as the press release went out, people who had followed the case, uh, they started uh, mobilizing. The investigation um, records were leaked and there was a general consensus by civil society and the media who had been watchdogging this case and who got to learn about the case. Um, said that the investigation had been poorly performed, that the reports had been edited, that there was just a whole catalog of errors that had been um, committed during the course of this investigation. So that actually launched the UN Secretary General himself to reopen the investigation. They took it out of the UNAIDS, the organization I was working for, and placed it with another investigative entity in New York. So uh, fast forward three more years of investigation than happened. And four and a half years after uh, uh, the assault actually had occurred, and long after the perpetrator had retired and the executive director had left and an institutional organization review prompted by my case had said that there was toxic workplace and lots of sexual abuse and abuse of power and donors had withheld fund. After all of that, there was finally then this um, uh, this uh, letter that reached me uh, where they said, we're sorry for what has happened to you. And that reached me almost six years after the uh, investigation had uh, concluded, uh, the assault had happened. And that's a long time to hold on for uh, for a feedback on your um, on your complaint. Uh, and I also learned that uh, the organization has spent 1.2 million US dollars. Um, only that was identified through a, an independent inspection report. So that's what they spent in trying to mitigate. Um, the consequences of this case going public and the impact it had on the organization. So really, uh, maybe when I just reflect back on my story and hoping that my bad experience could maybe uh, inspire others to do better in their organizations, uh, whether as safeguarding focal points or as investigators or as decision makers of these cases, I wanted to just sort of wrap up and, and conclude with a couple of few messages. Um, by the time a report happens, it's often preceded by previous allegations, rumors, anecdotes, observations. It was true in my case. Everybody knew that the perpetrator was inappropriate and no, yet nobody did anything about it. And we need to remember that these perpetrators, whether they're abusing women or children or LGBT or um, whomever they're, or, or young men and boys, we need to know that they have often perfected their modus operandi and also their persona so that it doesn't raise suspicion. And I think that um, my perpetrator considered himself a gender champion, uh, and that's how he was able to sort of mask his uh, inappropriate uh, and um, harmful behavior. Victims and survivors are very selective with to whom they disclose. Uh, and that's a way to keep control over the situation. And we mustn't push them in their journey of reporting a, an incident of SEA. Uh, organizations can always make take preventative and early action. Um, their the threshold shouldn't have to be that a rape has to happen or X amount of victims has to be hurt by a particular perpetrator. Um, and we can't turn a blind eye as colleagues, because as I told you, it does have considerable financial and political costs and notwithstanding the cost to the, to the victim itself. Um, the experience is life changing uh, and you don't uh, you don't live while the investigations are happening because you're just waiting, 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 waiting to have feedback to have justice and you're totally obsessed with this process wanting to get something out of it and even though it's extremely painful you tell yourself while you're not hearing back that you're doing the right thing that you have to go through it's painful but you have to do this to others and yet you're and you're dealing with no compassion there's no support there's no compassion there is no nothing and so it's really important that when that there is some level of um, understanding for what the victim is going through that they do have regular feedback that they are supported because and that the quality the process is of quality because otherwise quite frankly it does more harm than good and I would say it's even unethical to encourage people to report if we're going to mishandle the report when they come forward 
Victims need holistic support and accompaniment. You need to be prepared for all of this. You need to know what it is and you need to know what you can expect as an outcome. Um, I also think that there will be, uh, in many cases, investigations. We learn about the how to well conduct an investigation, and Lucy took us through that. But we have to be mindful as well that there are political forces in the community, religious leaders, uh, colleagues, uh, people around us that try to thwart and investigate the course of the investigation. And we need to be attuned to that and put safeguards in place when it comes to the handling of documentation, protecting witnesses, and also making sure that there is no retaliation and that it isn't accepted. Victims needs to be treated and their stories be uh, taken in good faith. We need to display the compassion that we would do. It's not because it happens at the workplace that one cannot meet a victim or a survivor with the compassion that you would meet a friend, a sister, uh, a mother or a child that would be going through this if it was your family member. Uh, I also think that there are systemic barriers that we really need to address together and our paper, I encourage you to take a look at it because it sort of sets out what needs to be in place before and what should come after the investigation. Investigation is not, it's just a, it's a process to have accountability, but it isn't an end in itself and it certainly is not a satisfactory outcome for the individual who's placing their trust in the hands of the investigator and in the organization. And finally, perhaps just to say that civil society, media, governments, judges, and donors, uh, they do have a role to play as partners. Sometimes we segment too much. In my story, they were the people that helped me in my own organization. There were people that I did not know, whereas my colleague, I had known them for, for 10 and at the end of this, almost 15 years. And they turned the back to me where there were other bold civil society activists that just opened their arms. And, uh, and that's why I think we need to work together. I will just stop it here, but thank you for listening to my story. Thank you so much, Martina, for sharing that story. Um, I think uh, you'll see in the comments, which I'll share with you after the webinar, just how uh, appreciative the uh, audience has been and the comments that they've sent to, to, of support to you. Um, so thank you, audience. Um, now we're going to turn to the Q&A, and I'd invite you and Lucy um, to, uh, we have a lot of questions. So um, I'd like to start um, the first question, um, which is something we hear a lot. What recommendations do you have um, if the victim does not want to give consent to proceed with an investigation? How do we manage that? Uh, shall I take this one, Sarah? Please. This one, this this is the, the question, it comes up a lot, um, and it's where taking a survivor-centred approach comes into conflict with due process and our accountability for the harm caused by our staff. Um, so if a survivor does not consent for an investigation to take place, well, first of all, um, we explore what other options might be available to us. As I said in the presentation, an investigation is not always the inevitable outcome if we have a concern about sexual exploitation and abuse. If it re we really do need an investigation to take place, what we need to do is to take a look at the, our commitment to the survivor for a survivor-centred approach versus the concern that there might be a staff member or a volunteer in our organisation who might have caused harm and might be continuing to cause harm and be a risk to people that they come into contact with. And it might be that under certain circumstances, we might actually need to go ahead with some sort of investigation or process, even if the survivor does not consent for that to happen. However, if those actions are taken, that's a decision that needs to be made at the absolute highest levels of the organisation. Um, it needs to look at what the impact on the survivor might be um, and it needs to be to be well documented and signed off. Hopefully we would not find ourselves in a position where there is that direct contradiction. Um, but, but if we are, those are the things that we need to take into consideration and to balance off before making that decision. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, the second question that I have for you both is, um, and there's a lot of questions in here about investigations manager. So I'm going to try to compile them right now. 
should the investigations manager have a legal background? Um, what are the key attributes and competencies that you think a legal investigator, uh, a, I'm sorry, administrative investigator should have? And um, is it something that um, people at different levels can be involved in? Do you have any reflections on that? And then finally, sorry, and then there's one last question about, do you think it would be better to have male or female investigators to create a rapport with the uh, perpetrator and the survivor? Um, shall I, I can at least, um, well, I can take both of those, but I think Martina might have interesting reflections on the latter question particularly. Um, so first of all, do investigators need to have legal experience? No. Um, as we said, this is a, it's a workplace administrative investigation. What survivors should have, uh, sorry, what investigators should have in terms of competencies um, is uh, that they're appropriately trained and they're experienced to deal with survivors of SEA and gender-based violence. So investigators come from many backgrounds. Some do come from a legal background, but it is important in that case that they are uh, trained and briefed on the procedures we use in, a, in an administrative investigation. Um, I think I saw somebody mentioning as well um, about having a legal uh, advice on retainer. Um, it is, if your organisation has the resources to do so, it is, it is useful and important to have a legal overview of all of your processes to make sure that you're confirming, conforming to labour law. Um, but the, the investigator themselves does not necessarily have to have a legal background. Um, in terms of uh, the gender of investigators, um, generally speaking, uh, it is usually the case that women and girls might prefer to speak to a woman about sexual exploitation and abuse, but that's not always the case and we shouldn't necessarily make that assumption. Um, however, it is important that we at least have the option and we have the capacity to have female investigators uh, should we need to use them. I think, um, Martina, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think, yeah, I agree with everything that Lucy has said. I would reflect on the fact with the male and female investigators, it might also depend how far, how long a time ago the trauma has happened. I think when it's really fresh, the idea of being sort of alone, I can reflect from my own experience, but being alone with sort of a man, it took me a long time before I would even ride with strangers in elevators because that's what the assault would happen. And I felt very uncomfortable in many settings, just being alone with strange men. So um, I think if you have an accompanying person there also, uh, maybe that changes the dynamic. But I do think that in my case, I was more comfortable with a woman. Having said that, I don't think that gender is the only attribute that would be important. I think it's about having feeling that you feel some sort of um, that, that the person that you're speaking to believes you. So I think the, the, the skills of the investigator and for me, more so than having just a, a legal background in processing the uh, the investigation and collecting the data, at least when it comes to interviewing the, the victim and potentially the witnesses, I think it's very important that you have a demeanor that is trauma-informed and sensitive. That can be taught, but I think it needs to come from the heart because you're at such a, a difficult, it's such a difficult process to go through that you really need somebody that really feel like they care and that you can trust. Thank you so much for that, Martina and Lucy. Um, and I also have participated in an investigation and I had a female investigator and she was not particularly empathetic. So um, I think it really um, is the person um, more so than the gender in my experience. Um, here's another very interesting question. Um, with many investigations, they're often inconclusive. Um, with a lack of evidence um, that is found. So they're non-substantiated. How do more of experienced investigators handle these kinds of cases? Uh, shall I take this one? Yes. Yeah, so um, usually in these workplace investigations, there are three possible outcomes. One is that the allegation is upheld due to information let's say, on the balance of probability to prove the allegation took place um, or that they are the information disproves the allegation. So it's not upheld. But we sometimes find ourselves in the circumstance where the allegation is not upheld because we couldn't find enough information to uphold it. 
And in that case, um, we default to, if we can't find enough information to uphold the allegation, then um, our staff member uh, is cleared in this particular incidence. Um, now, if, the, if an investigation is done thoroughly, it's, it's more possible than you might think to get enough information to uphold an allegation. Um, you know, we know that sexual exploitation and abuse is very rarely witnessed. It's the sort of thing that happens by its very nature when nobody else is in the room, of course. Um, but there might be other things that we can find. For example, I mentioned WhatsApp messages. Um, I've, I've been doing this uh, for a long time. It used to be text messages. Now it's WhatsApp messages. Um, we quite often find uh, provide us useful information. Um, there can be people that the survivor might have spoken to immediately after the incident who can um, bear witness to their, their distress and discomfort. Um, there can be dates, locations, all sorts of things that we can put together to build a picture um, that might enable us to determine uh, whether the allegation can be upheld or not upheld. Uh, sorry, I might be using interchangeable terminology here. Again, <laughs> notes on terminology. Sometimes we say disproved. Sometimes we say not upheld. Um, again, different organisations use, use different terminology. Um, but yes, um, it is. it can be a difficult situation to be in, but a thorough investigation can, can help to mitigate that where possible. Martina, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, there is a question specifically to you, Martina. What were the results of your investigation and were you compensated by the organization for the trauma that you experienced? So I, the final results of the new open investigation found they substantiated sexual harassment and uh, they also substantiated an event sim uh, there was a quote, they didn't use the word sexual assault, but it substantiated both of the allegations. And I'm still litigating uh, to access the report uh, and we're litigating regarding compensation. Thank you. Um, and Lucy, you um, had mentioned about in your answer about um, if the survivor does not wish to uh, participate in the investigation, um, quite a bit of interest in uh, the questions there. Um, what are some of these other options about how you can uh, continue with an investigation without uh, interviewing the survivor? Um, yeah, so there's two possibilities. So if the survivor consents for you to go ahead with the investigation, but not involving him or her. Um, that's where we look at this other information that I've mentioned that might be useful, what we call documentary information um, and interviewing other witnesses that might have information to share. Um, if the survivor does not consent for an investigation at all, some of the options that we can explore are to see if we can get any other reports relating to that staff member that might be useful. So. Sometimes we might go to a location and do some awareness raising and training um, to let people know that they can report incidents of SEA and just see if that generates any further reports and other um, reports that we can follow up on relating to that person. Um, if we are really concerned, we might consider um, moving that person to a uh, position where they're not coming into contact with uh, vulnerable or at-risk people until we can um, move forward on the situation. That can be a bit difficult because of course we, um, uh, we cannot um, prejudge that person uh, based on the report um, and we would need to follow due process. But if we are sig significantly concerned, that might be um, an option we might take or make sure that they work with vulnerable or at-risk people under close supervision. Um, there's never an easy option here. This can be a difficult circumstance to be in. Um, again, uh, it possibly happens less often than we might think that a survivor does disclose um, and then uh, says that they do not want any kind of follow-up or investigation to take place because um, quite often when a survivor discloses it's because they want something to happen. What we might do might not be the same as what they want to happen, but they, they want to see some sort of um, action of some kind. Um, but when it does, when it does happen, uh, those might be some of the options that we might explore. 
Thank you, Lucy. I know that there are many questions in line, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So I'd like to thank again, Lucy and Martina for this presentations and Martina specifically, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I know a lot of people were moved by that. Um, we will endeavor to answer the questions that were not answered in the webinar today. And we will send you, of course, the PowerPoints. Um, there will be a recording of the webinar and um, we will try to answer your questions and send some um, information back to you. Again, please go to our website. You can get our very informative how-to uh, note that Lucy wrote. And um, please check out Lucy and Martina's reports on the CHS Alliance uh, as well for Survivor Centered. Um, we'd like to thank our interpreters who helped us to communicate across Eastern Europe in Hungarian, Czech, and Ukrainian. And to our Safeguarding Europe team behind the scenes, Betty, Annie, and Mariam. And um, of course, all of our colleagues in Moldova, Romania, and Poland, Angela, Elena, and Carolina. There will be um, specific uh, webinars being held um, with Lucy in Romanian on in Moldova for Moldovan participants on the 4th of May, in Romania for Romanian participants on the 7th of June, and in Polish for Polish participants on the 20th of June. So stay tuned to our website, sign up for our uh, newsletter, and we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you all again. And again, thank you so much for your participation today.